good evening and uh, welcome to this session of Science and Cocktails. For, for the ones that do not know, this, uh, this cycle of lectures is organized uh, together with the Niels Bohr Institute and everyone who's involved in, in, this, in the organization of this uh, beautiful cinema. And it's, uh, main, the main purpose of this cycle is uh, basically to bring uh, science closer to people in an environment which is relaxed and you can be in equal footing with the scientist or the speaker himself by asking him questions at the bar or by making him drunk as if you were one of his friends. <laughs> the, other, uh, the other purpose of this is actually to uh, make more people more aware of scientific topics. It's uh, very often that science, when it comes to the public, it comes through the media and most of the time is distorted. So here you have a first a personal account from a scientist and you're able to ask him whatever you want. The other thing is that there is a, a lot of... Um, uh, a very important thing is the, what is behind the scientific method, the principles of, scienti of science. And one of them, uh, which is really important, is a big concern with the truth, with objective truth. And I think that today we'll have uh, an excellent example of such a thing, of research which is really aiming for finding the truth about physical reality. So tonight we'll have uh, Niels Herrit, he's an associate professor emeritus at uh, the Department of Chemistry at the University of Copenhagen. And he has been doing a lot of research in the collapse of the World Trade Center. Later, later on, we'll have uh, Yelte Muller, who's uh, the creator of the music project Crayon, and he plays uh, mathematical beats algorithm uh, with algorithm techniques. So if, if you're not really aware of uh, this kind of music, I would, I, would, uh, I would recommend you to stay and, and hear at least a little bit to be aware of it. So let's uh, thank uh, Niels Herrett for being here and let's start. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for this kind introduction. Yeah, I've been teaching chemistry at the University of Copenhagen for 42 years. Stopped recently. I still have my office, a few students, and the research. Uh, I'll entertain you for in two parts in a presentation about World Trade Center, and I usually say three guidelines for the proper conduct of the proceedings. First, you're welcome to cheer during my presentation. <laughs> Second, as Jay said, you may ask questions also on the fly during the presentation. You know, the only stupid question is the one not being asked. So please just raise your hand or whatever, wave with your handkerchief to get attention and come up with a question during the presentation. But point three, whatever question you may have, it should relate to what is going up up here. And we'll not be discussing politics tonight. This is science, and uh, we'll be, I'll, be I'll be presenting observations and facts, theories, hypotheses, and some very real objects as they presented themselves to the world prior to the terror attack on September 11, 2001, are the famous Twin Towers, who stood on the south end of uh, Manhattan. And uh, I've already now said south, meaning that we have to get a hold on the four corners of the world. So the photographer taking this picture was standing in New Jersey, meaning that he has his back to the west, is looking toward east, you have south to your right on this picture, and you have north to the left. So this was the North Tower. It was finished in 1970 and stood there in a height of 417 meters and 110 stories. And at that time, it was the tallest building in the world. The South Tower, and on top of that, there was an antenna, a TV antenna of 100 meters. The South Tower was finished in 1970 and equally tall, 417 meters, 110 stories. Now, how much did such a tower weigh? How heavy were they? 
the lowest estimate I have seen from the raw tower was 288,000 metric tons. And uh, if you add to that whatever you put into your tower in terms of furniture and cables and elevators and coffee machines and computers and people, let's say 350,000 tons. This is not important. What is important is that 90,000 roughly of these all these tons were steel because the towers were built around a steel skeleton they were what we call a steel framed high riser and the design at that time was innovative but it has been a, a template for all high rises built as steel framed ever since meaning that there was a core of very sturdy uh, columns in this case, 47 in numbers, and 236 perimeter columns all the way around. We will return much more to this aspect of the towers later on. Here you see a close-up uh, of the North Tower during construction, just to give you a feel for the dimensions. This is a column, a so-called box column. This is a construction worker. These are the perimeter columns, and we will return much more to that. On the morning of 9-11, which we call it from now on, September 11th, 2001 is called 9-11, among friends, and so are we. So on, on the morning of 9-11, there was a French TV crew walk uh, out in the small streets of southern Manhattan, following a young man who uh, wanted to be a firefighter. You call him a rookie, an American. And uh, nothing had happened for a month, so we don't know what the mood was. And there to, but the little station where he was um, located, there, were, there came in an alarm. Of, there was a smell of gas in one of the small streets. And there was nothing else to do. So what you see here is actually the fire chief himself uh, going out to check for this to gas eventually coming up from the underground. It was 8.46 in the morning. And then we heard a plane come over. And in Manhattan, you don't hear planes too often, especially loud ones. This was a North Tower, the one with the antenna. It was hit 14 minutes to 9 by Flight 11. 17 minutes later, this thing happened. I've seen it from the front angle before, but not from this angle. Tower. 56 minutes later, this thing happened. This is as close as we can get to the base of the World Trade Center. You can see the firemen assembled here, the police officers, FBI agents, and you can see the two towers. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. The South Tower collapsed after 56 minutes. I have the same event in another recording where you can see the South Tower actually starts tilting before it comes down. We'll return to this observation later on. Appearing to fall away from the rest of the building. Can we go to the tape now? Here we go, right here. This is, I mean, when you look at it, the building has collapsed. That tower just came down. Let's go to Bob Bazell, who was at St. Vincent's Hospital. Bob. Then about half a minute went by, half an hour went by, and you can guess what we're going to see now. This is the North Tower. If you're 
fast you can see the antenna goes down first. Again, I have the same event in another recording, this time taken from New Jersey on a long distance, and we can see how gigantic these structures were. This, however, is not what we are going to talk about for the first half of my presentation. My presentation comes in two halves. And uh, before we take an intermission, in about 40 minutes, uh, we will turn our attention to the fact that World Trade Center was a center. Until four years ago, I thought that World Trade Center were the Twin Towers. But there were seven buildings in World Trade Center. The North Tower, had number one, the South Tower was number two, World Trade Center three, the Marriott Hotel was 22 stories, not very tall, number four, number five, and number six were even smaller, nine stories. But World Trade Center seven over here was a bigger building. Here we see the area, this time taken from the south. So this is number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, and World Trade Center seven, was lying on the other side of a little street called Vesey Street. World Trade Center was a younger building compared with the towers. It was finished in 1987, but still is a gigantic building uh, for Danish standards. 186 meters high, 47 stories, and, and a, a footprint a little less than a soccer field. Now this is three times Rissus Pitele on Tain's right. Next time you go to to H.G. Oster Institute on the Spore Institute, take a look at Ries Hospital. This is three times Ries Hospital. Quite an impressive building. Here we see the building uh, in the morning at a time when the North Tower had been hit, the South Tower has not been hit yet, and building 7 presents itself to the world as a modern, impressive building uh, covered with brown marble. Uh, and um, it stood there actually in the afternoon, but 20 minutes past five. This is roughly seven hours after the collapse of the North Tower. This thing happened. It's gone, man. This was building seven. Allow me a few questions, a little question to the audience. How many of you are seeing this for the first time? Okay, more than half, thanks. I have, uh, there are several videos of this event. I show you just three in the beginning here. This is taken down West Broadway Street on a distance so you can see actually how impressive the building was. And uh, the next one is taken from Midtown Manhattan so it's a little diffuse and it's a low resolution video. But it is instructive because you can see actually the profile of the building and how it's going down quite symmetrically. Let me try to push up the bottom. Now we go to video tape the collapse of this building. Yeah, it's remarkable. Amazing, incredible, tricky word. For the third time today, Reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much in television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. And 
And this was Dan Rather, who had been news anchor on CBS for 42 years. And he had a slip of tongue, if you recognize me. Building 7 came down into a little tidy pile. 20 meters. Was there a question? Yeah, what did he say? Pardon? What did he say? Well, he said that these pictures are reminiscent of uh, what you used to see on television when uh, you knock down buildings with dynamite. Uh, building 7 came down into a little pile about 20 meters, two stories high, without barely scratching the buildings around it. You see, no damage to the buildings here. Maybe there's a little chunk, the corner of this house, which was taken off here. This is the same area, this time photographs from the south, where you can see the only damage to the building was here. But roughly, it comes exactly in, down into its own footprint and leaving nothing else but the steel skeleton. Everything else in the building was completely pulverized into dust. We'll return to that later. But just to give you a feel for this, how remarkable this event is, I put in this picture taken from a time when the world was still standing. And, and it, so this is building seven and it actually ends up in a little pile barely hitting the sidewalks on the other side of the street. This is the car. There's a, it's a, almost 200 meters down, okay? Now we'll call, we'll call the cause of event an implosion. Maybe in this educated audience, I don't have to mention that an explosion is what you can observe when a container, when the pressure is too high and it, poof, every, it fragments outwards in all directions. But imagine you have lungs like Superman and you can suck out all the air of, say, a soda can and it will go, it will collapse into itself. We call this an implosion because the resulting pile, what happened is that the middle of the building ended up in the middle of the pile and the other panels kind of folded on top of it. So it's, technically, this is an implosion. Now returning to what Jay mentioned, the scientific method. This is the method we're going to apply tonight, meaning uh, that we will start asking uh, uh, questions, uh, what is happening here, and then we'll do observations, then we'll come up with a hypothesis. And I will not refrain from mentioning that this very method actually has its origin in this area geographically, because Chugobar, who was um, who was sitting on the little island of V, maybe some of you foreigners doesn't know that, but he was a nobleman sitting on an island out in the sound. And he was looking, he was just making observations. For 20 years, he was watching the sky, not day and night, only nights, and making records, in particular, of Mars. And um, he was not a mathematician, so he just took notes uh, by instinct. And this is usually considered as the birth of modern science. He made observations. And so this should we just recognize. This actually, for those who are curious, to the right is the, uh, the orbit of Mars, but still in the Ptolemyan picture of the world, which had to change. Uh, Barr did not dare to believe that the solar was in the center of our planetary system. Now, so now we, we are making observations. I'm just bringing in Chugo Barr to make clear that we have to stick to this method. We are making observations. How, how we take a look. How was World Trade Center constructed? Well, the design was very much for what I've just told you about the towers. There was a core of very, of very strong columns, and there was a perimeter. And this time, it was only half the height of the, of the, of the towers, which was overdimensioned to a large extent. And in the, in the intermediate 25 years, people have been better constructing this. So there are only 24 sturdy core columns here and 57 perimeter columns all the way around. And they are connected horizontally, obviously, with beams and girders. And then the floors are lying like bookshelves on the horizontal girders here, steel beams here, like yeah, completely lying like bookshelves. The floors does not support anything. They're just there. Of course, they support the people working in the offices, but they do not support the rest of the building. All of the load is on the columns. 
and it's about between 60 and 70 percent is carried by the core columns and the rest is carried, carried by the perimeter columns. I do not have a good picture of building seven during construction. So I have to take you back to the pictures I showed in the beginning to give you again a dimension of the, of the um, a feel of the dimensions here for, for the, the towers. And uh, like, uh, uh, this, is, this is a so-called box column. And the sides here, at the bottom of the towers, were 16 centimeters thick. This is the thickness of the steel just in, in, in the wall of these columns. In the top, it's a little less, obviously, because it had to support less. So it's about 10 centimeters. It goes from 16 to 10 centimeters over these 417 meters. Now this is, excuse me, this is what a floor looks like. You have a very light, uh, what you say, framework, steel framework, and this is a floor beam. Uh, and on top of it, there's a very thin steel plate. On top of the steel plate, you have a concrete floor between 10 and 18 centimeter thick. Yeah, so there's a very light construction. They are, they are situated on seats out here. And as I said, the floors do not carry anything except for the people and whatever was on the floors. Now back to building seven, to, just to give you an impression of the steel structure, what, which is what it's all about. This is what, what the facade looks like. And you'll notice the, horizon, the, the vertical columns and the horizontal beams making together like a mosquito web. And what do you do with the mosquito net when you punch a pencil through it? What happens? Nothing. Well, the mosquitoes can fly in and out, but the, the, the net is still there. And the same thing you could say about this very, very tight framework. This is a picture of Building 7 where the artist has removed all the floors, all the windows, all the doors, and what is left is only the steel skeleton. And this is and what you call it with the children's climbing up in the playground. Yeah, Such a thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, but, uh, but it's 186 meters tall. So it's one gigantic uh, uh, framework, steel framework. And this is what it's all about. This is what the core of our destruction here in the first part of my, of my present. Let's, let's repeat. <laughs> This, is, this was building seven. This is our challenge. Why, why, did, why did this happen? Obviously, gravity plays a role here. But one thing, and, and the building is coming down, and you may ask, actually, how long time does it take for an object to fall 186 meters? Now, we have mentioned Chugoba already, and the next scientist coming to mind was Galileo. Galilei Galileo. And uh, because he, did, he was the first one not do, not only making observations, but also doing experiments. And one thing he enjoyed very much was throwing out objects from what you call the screw tower and piece, and what you call actually what you call it? the leaning tower. The leaning tower, yes, in Pisa. And he he was throwing objects out of the and he discovered and actually in those days scientists were kind of heroes. And it's true, the population of Pisa were standing around the tower watching him doing this. And they were flabbergasted by this simple observation <laughs> that two objects fell at the same speed if they were sufficiently heavy. And so what he found out, and we are we're in the early 17th century, so it is, um, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah. At exactly 400 years ago, he did these experiments. And he found out the two very famous laws of falling, uh, according to Galilei. One, that all bodies, if they had the same wall, fall with the same velocity, the same speed. They hit the ground at the same time, much to the astonishment of the citizens of Pisa. And he also found out, and I'm simply at awe that he could do this, he, they didn't have stopwatches. But he found out that the dropping distance, can you all see this down here? The dropping distance is proportional to the time square. 
He did not know the constant. He was a mathematician, but he did not know actually the constant here, which should make this a real equation. We'll return to this later, to another gentleman called Isaac Newton. But first, we'll do some measurement on building seven. How fast did it come down? The technology used here is very simple. It's a computer program called Tracker, where you can put in the video and you can fix a point uh, in which you want to follow over the, uh, the, the pictures. And since you have in America, you have 30 frames a second, here we have 25 frames a second, meaning that you have an internal clock very accurately, you can determine the position of this point as a function of time as it's coming down. And the point we are watching here is the northwest corner of building seven and how it's coming down. And this we are plotting now in a scheme, not the position as a function of time. We pu just push a button in the program and ask him to plot the velocity as a function of time. I'm sure you can all appreciate this. And since the building is going down, the curves is going down as well. And uh, what you see here is, uh, yet yeah, this is a downward motion as a function of time. Actually, uh, this is, it has been done twice. And this result is from a low resolution video. If you switch to a high, I, I just show it for completeness and also to credit the person who did this, who I'll present later on. But if you, when you do this on a high resolution video, it looks like this. Also because we'll need these preceding eight seconds prior to descent. And what you know, there are two features here. One is that the building goes directly down. There's a, really a kink here. It's in rest and then it goes down. Next, there's the slope of this line. Here it is 10, actually 10, uh, what is, meters per second squared. Uh, but here we have, to, in the low resolution video, we obtain 9.88 meters per second squared, which those of you knowing about physics will recognize as a free fall, uh, or maybe we should ask somebody who really knows about this, and this is Isaac Newton. I asked him, <laughs> and, uh, you, and, and he wrote a, a very famous book, no, actually he published a very famous book in 1687. He had it lying in the drawer for 20 years. He didn't dare to publish it because, you know, Galileo had been treated very uh, hostile very unfriendly by the Catholic Church in 1633 so he kept it in the drawer but it was then Halley came along you know the guy with the comet and said you have to publish this so okay let's put it out in 1687 and this is the most important book as you probably know of, uh, of, of science it tells everything about how objects move in the physical world as we know it before quantum mechanics came along so he really knows. And uh, what I asked him, what does it mean that the speed is constantly increasing? And I said, this is constant acceleration. Those of you who are not skilled in physics would recognize acceleration from when you're driving your car. You know, when the speed goes up, you feel you're being pushed back in your seat. This is acceleration. I said, we found an acceleration. This is the slope of the straight line of 9.88 meters per second squared. He said, this is free fall. Now, what is free fall? Your free fall should be taken literally. It means that something is falling freely. And he even came up with a formula for the free fall. And please notice, this is what Galilei found out roughly 50 years earlier. But Newton could provide the constant. And it was one half times g, which is called the gravitational constant. And this is, this is the, uh, the 9.88 meters per square second. It's a little bit on the high side. If any of you are so good at physics that you can come up with a suggestion why, we are always a little bit on the high side. I don't know what the gravitational constant is in New York City, but I know we always come out a little bit on the high side. We do not understand why. But I took my pocket calculator a while ago and made a little calculation, actually, how long time will it take for an object to fall two meters? It's very easy. And it came out with 0.66 seconds. So uh, for those of you who will not be bored by this, 
pilot B, I will make a little physical demonstration. I will actually subject my hairbrush to free fall from two meters. I count to four, I release it on three. One, two, three, four. Uh, if you had been faster with the stopwatch, you would have come up with 0.66 seconds. <laughs> now, this is a very, very important and completely fundamental observation. It means that when the 47th floor of building 7 starts to move, it falls as if there's absolutely nothing below it. At that moment, every supporting structure of the building has been eliminated. If some, excuse me, idiot had been standing on the 47th floor and in that moment released an apple or a stone, that apple, that stone would be falling at the same speed as the 47th floor. I think I have a little video illustrating this. The ball has started to drop, yet Seven World Trade is still above the starting line. This is free fall. At the one second mark, Seven World Trade and the ball are still even. Seven World Trade indeed falls 100 meters in four and a half seconds. So these are the observations that we have made. We have found out that building seven comes down in free fall speed. We have found that it goes into the free fall speed with sudden onset. It goes directly from rest into free fall. There is no, what did you say? Yeah. And, and the entire upper front. Building seven fell completely symmetrically. Those of you dealing with symmetry in your calculations know the symmetry is a very important property of nature and building seven fell all the way down. And even if you flunked all the physics classes in your life, you can count to three. And we have to remind ourselves that there were two airliners, but there were three skyscrapers. Building seven was not hit by an airliner. 